Today I want to talk about writing advice from Mark Haddon. His most famous work is probably his novel, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It won loads of awards and it was adapted to a stage show. I've read it and I enjoyed it. But my favourite piece of work from him is his short story collection, The Pier Falls, which I've talked about a lot on this channel recently. So links to those in the description. Some of this writing advice is from interviews and some of it's directly from his own website, but here's Mark Haddon's tips for writers. Number one, when I sit down to write, I know that most of what I produce will end up being discarded. And to write in spite of that knowledge takes more confidence than I possess on a regular daily basis. Not necessarily a tip, but nevertheless something I think is important to talk about. I've been writing for quite a few years now, and I remember when I first started that I considered myself as different from published authors. I thought they did things in different ways than I did. They'd learned secrets that I hadn't yet. I figured they came up with ideas and sat down with total confidence and just wrote their books and the end product of that first draft was pretty close to what ends up getting published. And I thought also that they probably never really worried about confidence. They never really questioned their own ability as a writer because they were published. They knew they could do it. But that isn't the case. The more of these videos about author writing advice I've done, the more I've come to realise that every author has the same kind of worries. And there might be different degrees of worrying between one author and another, but still the same troubles come to all of us sometime or another. So if you identify with what he said about vast amounts of your work being discarded, or maybe you just don't love a huge amount of something that you've written and you end up trashing it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you're a bad writer. It doesn't necessarily mean that that was bad writing. I'm somewhere in between, personally. I've thrown away entire novels and I've thrown away half drafts of novels. I've deleted them permanently, never to see the light of day again, because I just assumed they were so bad. And to some extent, they probably were. But I've also written really accurately and kept first drafts of things that haven't really changed much after I've worked on them. I can't speak for every writer, obviously I can only speak for myself, but I tend to find that how much of a project I throw away or keep just depends on the project. It's not really a thing that's inherent in me and the way I write, it just tends to be based on the story that I'm writing. But my advice, if I was to add on to that, would be that it's all about where you end up, not how you get there. It doesn't matter if you have to throw away large amounts of your writing in order to get to the stuff that you really love. In the end, who's going to know and who's going to care? Nobody. They just want to read the end product. And if that end product is good, no one really cares how you got there. The other interesting thing you can take from that point is that obviously Mark Haddon's confidence varies on a daily basis, as well as ours might. When I was still mainly aiming to be a traditionally published writer, there were a lot of things that were aspirations to me that I thought would drop into place as soon as I was published. And I thought confidence would be one of those things, but clearly it isn't. I think the true route to confidence in writing, if there is one, rather than just accolades and being traditionally published, is just trying different things, trying to get familiar with as many different aspects of your craft as you can learning things, new skills and new techniques so that you feel like you're better able to handle the story that comes to you. The way I look at my own confidence when it comes to writing is that I don't really have a lot of control over it and I probably never will. Some days I'm gonna feel good about it, some days I'm not, but whatever the case, as long as I keep writing, that's all you can really do. And that's the best way to keep progressing and getting better as a writer. Number two, it's harder to procrastinate when other people are watching. I'm not really a coffee shop writer, and that's sort of what he's talking about here if you read the interview, but I think you can look at this in a different way. It doesn't necessarily have to be about people being around you and witnessing you doing your writing or whatever. I think I would look at this more in terms of community. I know some writers work really well with accountability partners, other writers that are also working on projects so you can share your progress and check in and make sure you keep adding to your story. But for me, that's not really how it works. I do tend to work fairly well on my own and I generally am okay with motivating myself most of the time. However, when I'm totally without community with writing, that's when I get a bit lost. I won't go on and on about my years of never speaking to other writers because that's something I've talked about plenty on this channel already. But what I found when I was like that is that I never really developed that much. I didn't have anything to share with anybody. I didn't read anybody else's writing in progress. I was only reading fantastic published works and comparing myself against that. So what ended up happening for me was procrastination by stagnation in a way. I was still writing novel after novel, thinking I was progressing, but I wasn't testing myself. I wasn't taking feedback from anybody. I wasn't learning new things. I wasn't putting myself out there. I was just sitting 
in the comfortable bubble that I was in. And if that isn't procrastination, I'm not really sure what is. Now that I have this channel, which is a place for me to share my own writing and on my website as well, link in the description, there's always a place for me to put something that I write or there was always an end goal for projects that I can put together and then publish even just myself as well as sending out to journals and other places. But it's that outside, not pressure, but encouragement or opportunity really that keeps me going a lot of the time and helps me avoid procrastination. So definitely agree with that. Number three, writing is like surgery or flying a plane. You need to be firing on all cylinders or you need to be doing something else. I wouldn't necessarily compare writing to flying a plane or performing surgery. Something tells me there's probably a little more at stake in those particular professions. But still, I understand what he means by this. And um, it's something that I do agree with. I've done some experiments on this particular topic on my channel already, and I'll link those videos down in the description. But essentially what came out of them was the realization that whether I was firing on all cylinders or just not really feeling it that, that day, the end product of the writing at least from a reader's perspective, didn't feel all that different. So maybe there's grounds to disagree with this tip. However, how I feel when I am firing on all cylinders or really feeling in the mood for writing is a lot different. I feel like I have so much more fun when I feel into it and my mind's in the right place compared to when I sit down and think I really need to write something so I, I better get on with it. That I don't find anywhere near as much fun. You could argue that the end product is more important than how I feel about it as I'm doing it, but really, I'm not aiming to be traditionally published. I'm writing for myself and for my channel and for my website, so I think fun is really the most important part of it for me. So unless I can figure out how to have fun even when I'm not feeling all that great about what I'm writing, I'd have to say I definitely do agree with this point. I need to be firing on all cylinders. That's just how I write, but you may be very much different and that's fine. Number four, I don't think I would keep writing without being driven by a constant nagging voice at the back of my head saying over and over, that wasn't good enough. Write more, write better, time is running out. That is pretty much my day-to-day -day inner monologue when it comes to writing. I've always in a position of looking for something that I can do better or find out that I didn't know before. It might be obvious from watching my videos and I kind of hope it is, but constant improvement is something that definitely drives me. And I think it's something good to aim for because while having fun with writing, as I just talked about, is definitely a good goal and something that I think should be at the forefront of the reason why you do it. I think constant improvement gives you that motivation and that little more reason to keep going sometimes. The important thing that I try to remember with this though is that I measure my progress internally and not externally. I'm not thinking I need to be better so I can win more prizes. I need to be better so I can get published. I need to be better so everyone will know that I'm a great writer. None of that comes into it for me at all. I want to be better so that I can prove to myself that I've learned something or that I've mastered something and that's what drives me more than outside validation. I think when you quietly work hard and try to improve and focus on your weaknesses and also play to your strengths, I think that comes out through your writing. I think focusing on what makes everybody else better than you isn't always that healthy an idea and it's not always that motivational or that encouraging when you're trying to get better at something. It's always worth looking at what you can do better and there always is something you can do better. It doesn't matter who you are. However, it's worth remembering to what you're good at and what you already do well and enjoying that a little bit. The way I look at it is that the voice in the back of my head that's pushing me forward day after day, trying to make me better and trying to help me learn things is doing just that. It's trying to help me. It's trying to carry me forward. It's not trying to push me forward or trying to drive me forward. I'm getting a little bit meta, but the voice is on my side and it's helping me achieve what I want to achieve. And that's why I think it's useful. Number five, it's not about you. Readers don't want an insight into your mind, they want an insight into their own. A book that will put them in touch with a part of themselves they didn't even know existed. That's a really good point, I think, and it's something that's really easy to miss when you're writing, at all levels. There's a very subtle difference between putting your heart into something and making something entirely about you. I think especially if you know a lot about your subject matter or you're drawing on real life experience for your story, it's easy to fall into that trap of making it really about your experience rather than the general experience and how it could apply to everybody else. It sounds harsh when I put it like this. I'm sure the inside of your brain is a really interesting place and all of your ideas are really interesting. However, 
The person that they are most interesting in the world to, I guarantee, is you. The best way to make use of those ideas is to find out how you can apply them to everyone else, how you can make them universal and you can make them understandable by everybody else around you. If your work is, as he says, an insight into your mind, then it's a very narrow cross-section of life and that some people will be able to identify with. However, if you widen that cross-section, you'll find more people are able to identify with it. More people will find reasons to fall in love with your stories. And whether you want commercial success or recognition or anything, I think appealing to more people and allowing more people to feel something, some kind of emotional connection or some kind of connection of experience to your writing is something we should all aim for and probably something we all want. It's really hard to find those moments if you write solely from your perspective in that very narrow cross section, I find. Number six, read your work out loud, preferably to other people. Things that work or don't work are sometimes invisible on paper, but obvious when heard. This is a tip that I've heard very often and very rarely put into practice myself. However, if you've seen any of my recent videos, you'll know that I'm reading a 100 word story in pretty much every one of them. And I have found that when I've read these stories, I definitely notice things that I didn't notice when I was writing it. Even though they're only 100 words long, I still spot things that I wanna change. I don't know if it's because your mind is only hearing what you want to hear when you read things silently or your brain is just picking up what you already think that you put down, but when you read it out loud, it does make some kind of difference. And I find it's useful to me as a bit of perspective because it's challenging to write um, even a 100 word story every week or every couple of weeks and to post that knowing that a few hundred people at least are going to watch that and read that story or hear that story along with me. So reading it out loud for me, it's sort of a first audit of the story really. It makes me focus on where the points of emphasis are in each sentence or whether things sound right as they come out, whether there's too much of the same sound in a sentence or not enough of when it becomes a monotone, that kind of thing. Just like that sentence did not come out right at all. The one thing that sticks out to me about this advice is how are you supposed to listen to an entire novel out loud? How are you supposed to read an entire novel out loud? I suppose you could do if you live alone or you live with people that are patient enough to hear you mumbling to yourself in another room for or the same room for hours on end but I would find that a challenge I think. I write mainly flash fiction and short stories so it's feasible that I could read everything that I write out loud. I suppose you'd have to cut it into chapter by chapter and just do bits at a time. That's the obvious way to do it but it still seems like quite a big undertaking. However, if it works and if it does really help you spot things that you can't see otherwise then I definitely think there's you know, reason to do it. For me, it almost feels like it's a different version of myself doing the reading than did the writing. And I suppose if you're not going to send your work to another person, this is as close as you're going to get to another mind entirely reading your story and giving you feedback on it. So if you've got the time and the patience and a drink of water, maybe try it. It could be well worth it. Number seven, all half decent writers have a nagging voice in their head telling them which bits work and which don't. Maybe you can't hear it yet. Maybe you don't want to hear it. Cultivate this voice and learn to trust it. This is a really difficult thing when you're new to writing because a lot of the time, everything you're doing feels like it's not right. It's hard to figure out whether you're just being overly critical or whether you just don't have enough information to figure out whether you're doing a good job or not. That's really hard. The only answer, the only way to tune into that voice properly is to keep writing more and more and also I think to keep reading and not necessarily just those fantastic perfect published pieces of work alliteration that you know are available for you to compare yourself to and to aspire to be like but also to read other people's works in progress other writers of a similar level to you or just a level above or a level below you know subjectively however you want to look at that it's worth looking at how other people do things as well because that will develop that voice. You'll apply that voice to other people's writing and that just builds its volume in your own mind and you'll be able to figure out how to do it to your own writing as well. When you do figure out how to hear that voice and how to actually listen out for it, it's endlessly useful. And for me, usually it's a good portion of time after I've written the first draft or the second draft, when I'm editing something, that's when I hear that voice the clearest. 
but it's not a permanent fixture. Sometimes I can read something back and that, that voice is clear as day telling me to change something about the story. Other times it's not there at all. And it's not about the actual story because I can come back to it at a different time and the voice is there. It's just one of those things like everything with writing that is inconsistent, difficult to do regularly and just hard to master. For me, I find that there's imposter versions of this voice in my head as well. And that imposter version will try to make me change things based on something other than the good of the story. On days when I'm not feeling particularly motivated about my writing or I feel really tired, I can fall for that impersonation and I can change something or I can look at my writing in general in a whole other light and I lose the truth of that actual real guiding voice. It's not so much about recognizing it every time you see it, it's about generally understanding what that voice really wants from you and what that voice is really guiding you towards on over a longer period. I feel like I'm just waffling at this point, but anyway, it gets easier the more you write, but it's inconsistent as always. That's just my take on it as another writer that's just learning my craft. Anyway, I hope this was useful. If it was, please consider subscribing. As always, thank you so much for watching and happy writing.